It is time, Jeff. It is. It's time. I feel the need, the need for podcasting. No, so not speed. No, no, I don't do drugs. No, no, nor fly planes. No, No. especially never at the same time. I am, I am, I am, I would not fit in the cockpit. Let's just put it that way. No, (laughs) no, no. I wouldn't want to be in the cockpit. They don't. Yes. There are people out there. Hey, if you're one of these people, tell me in the comments who have like the flight simulators, like with the planes and the stuff. And like they build like mock up spaces and everything for me, just knowing that room exists in the plane in front, like freaks me out a little bit. That's just a lot of dials and gauges and stuff. And you know what? A boat 800 feet under the water and that stuff. You you know what though? Honestly, as a, uh, as a sound guy, like I get, I get some of these massive space age consoles. That's just a ton of, of, of buttons dials. and knobs and dials. There, there was one that came out not too long ago. I swore it was like the control panel on the enterprise. It was amazing. I loved yeah. working on this, on this console. It's not that big of a deal because each section has a different thing. And, and like you, it just breaks down and you're just not a big deal. And like, I have like a whole like setup that goes around me and it's, it's all fine. Which once you know what you're doing. Yeah. Jeff, we're not here to talk about that. Nope. We're here to talk about Babylon five. You guys out there, you are getting ready to watch Jeff and I record a podcast on what is this episode? Whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi episode two of season four, Jeff, we are rolling. We are season four this- is off and, and running uh, lots to talk about with this one. Uh, interesting, interesting episode yeah super interesting episode this is one of those episodes i feel like had it been in the middle of season two we would have been like what the heck was this what is this what does this we even just, mean we just we what just is- spun our wheels for 45 minutes and you know and people are like, well it's world building and it's this and it's that i'm like yeah but what are we we're not going anywhere with it you know this doesn't mean a thing i don't want why are we talking about first ones or whatever right. but now now this is at the beginning of the fourth season yeah. and it's kind of like oh my gosh yeah. this is amazing yeah spoiler alert i'm super excited to get to delta furies yeah like you should be i may i may want to just like i may shorten the upfront conversation just to get to that conversation just to go <laughs> but uh jeff listen uh we're gonna you're gonna hit record or not record you're going to hit the go button on that over there in just a moment. You guys out there, you're going to watch Jeff and I do this. This is the behind the scenes recording of Jeff and I uh, recording the audio podcast. So you guys are going to get all the bloopers. You're going to get the outtakes. You're going to get the rabbit trails. You're going to get everything that goes into how a podcast is made, including all the long pauses that sometimes we take all the flubs. I love the flubs. Uh, and you get to do it while staring at our beautiful faces for the next hour or so. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, make sure you guys subscribe wherever that button is on your screen and, uh, comment down below. We love to read those and try to comment back if we can and, uh, make sure you like the video. You guys know how YouTube works. You guys are awesome. Uh, Jeff, why don't Let's you do it. hit that sweet little button over there. You are valued and you are needed. You will be emperor. I think you're about to go where everyone has gone before. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters watching Babylon 5 for the very first time, and we are searching for what we call those Star Trek-like messages, uh, but we're really trying to see how Babylon 5 does them in its own special way. And this is not a podcast about Star Trek. It's in the title. It's right there. Not a Star Trek podcast. To keep us honest, we play the rule of three. This is a game where each one of us gets three, up to three references to Star Trek per episode. That's it. Three. three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> hey, Brent. Hey, Jeff. We have a five-star review. Oh, yes. 
It's from Apple Podcast. Jeff, I'm sorry. I got to stop you. Oh, yeah. So something about that sound clip. There is this little, like, there's this little moment right at the end, and I don't know what Jakar is doing, but it sounds like he snorts at the end. Have you ever noticed this? Let me listen. Let me listen. Like, Hold on. Okay, here we go. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I never got that. <laughs> I've never said anything, but it always makes me laugh just a little bit. I love that scene though, like because literally he's just like, oh, oh he's yeah. like, oh. <laughs> it's it's like he's Daddy Pig from Peppa Pig or something. <laughs> Sorry, oh man, go Sorry. ahead, <clears throat> reset. This is from Apple Podcast. Nineties kid yells at Cloud says, and this is actually really timely given our conversation last week. Great to listen to, frustrating, for all the right reasons. Happy I've caught up with the shows and I can listen on my Monday commute. No false advertising here. The hosts are an encyclopedia of Star Trek, an encyclopedia of Star Trek knowledge and great at connecting their first watch to both Trek and in an oddly fitting way, organizational leadership dynamics. If I have one frustrating thing, it's how not encyclopedic their knowledge is of other influences of this show, like Tolkien and other classic sci-fi novels and movies. Not making the connections between Clark's Rama or, well, to avoid spoilers, lots of things in The Lord of the Rings has me yelling at my phone on the regular. Guys, Zahadum, Kazadum, yeah. so many connections. Loving every minute, though, even the frustrating parts. Jeff, I have a question. Okay. Is this an older review that we're just uh, a couple into? weeks, a couple weeks old? Yeah. A couple weeks. Are you sure? Might be a little older. I don't know. Like well, we didn't, we didn't make that connection, honestly, to like three weeks ago. So, right. Well, I, because I, I remember back, it was season two when we had in the shadow of Zaha Doom, which was the first time we ever heard the phrase Zaha Doom. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, there was a lot of people in the comments talking about the bridge of Kaza doom and stuff. And I it just sort of, I think went over our heads. We didn't, we didn't uh, come back to it, but I think I remember maybe, maybe I'm dreaming it. I'm not really sure. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we're, we're just on the backlog right now. Uh, I will say this, particularly after like in these last couple of weeks and seeing some stuff, one of the premises we started the show with was kind of going, okay, so we've always heard that Deep Space Nine supposedly ripped off Babylon 5. Let, I, I kind of want to see what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I need a better word than rip off, Jeff. Give me, uh, give me Leveraged, a Leveraged, inspired Le by? Yes, okay. I would say that based on what I'm seeing now, it almost seems to me, and I haven't seen the whole show, but it almost seems to me that Babylon five was more inspired by Lord of the Rings than deep space nine was inspired by Babylon five. I agree. And also if we like really start digging back and we're going to talk about some of this here in a little bit, Lord of the Rings was inspired by a lot of stuff before that. A lot of Greek and Roman mythology, sure. the Bible, like very specifically Tolkien is famously famously a very devout person and the whole Lord of the Rings trilogy is really an examination of Christ and, and all the stuff that goes along with that. So, um, this goes way back. So yeah, I think, uh, well, and I think I, we talked about it for Casey Hudson, who was one of the executive producers for mass effects. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, we borrowed from Babylon five and Buck Rogers and star Wars and star Trek because everyone borrows from everyone. And that's how this works. And Babylon five borrowed from bubble from Bubble. those yeah, as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I remember yeah. you saying that. I remember you saying that. But, uh, how dare he say I have not an encyclopedic knowledge. Right, seriously. Actually, I may not have an encyclopedic knowledge, but I do have a pretty, I think I have a pretty good grasp on a lot of these things, despite what I people think, out there say. I think we do pretty good. Yeah. You know, I, I'd say at least once a week, someone's like, oh my gosh, I never made that that connection before. I promise you we're going to make a Lord of the Rings connection in this episode. Yeah. Promise a, a Bible, you it's going to happen. A Bible one too. There's going to be oh, a Bible yeah. one in this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
In fact, well, hey Brent, it might be a Lord of the Rings connection and a Bible connection in the same reference. Right? It's weird. Weird how that works. Hey, you Jeff. Know? <laughs> hey, you know what? What's that? We have another five star review. Oh, yes. I'm never not going to hear that now. <laughs> <laughs> you've, ruined, you've ruined the drop. I'm going to go in after this. I think and fix it. I'm going to be like, can I just take that little piece away? This one's also from Apple Podcast. Big Bucks Mama says, that's a great name. I think, oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Big Bucks Mama says, uh -huh. my favorite B5 podcast. I absolutely love this podcast. Jeff and Brent are fantastic, and their guesses are always so spot on. Unless the times that they're not. And then they are really far off. But I won't tell you which is which because, well... Spoilers. Well, for now, all I will say is when comes to get ready because we'll reveal that he is and you won't even see it coming. Then we'll and you're going to love it. Big Bucks Mama violated the rule of three there pretty <laughs> judiciously. Uh... I think Big Bucks Mama might have confused uh, uh, Star Trek references and buzzes with uh, spoilers, but whatever. Yeah. Still uh, fun. Okay, so here's the thing. First of all, shout out to you, Big Bucks Mama. I think, I, okay, I don't know who Big Bucks Mama is, but like our friend Wash, Big Bucks Mama has been, has like kind of followed me through several different podcasts that I've had really? over the years. That's and cool. and she, I'm going to assume it's a she, uh, like emails in and occasionally tweets and different stuff like that. So it's just, it's fun. Listen, when you're hearing this big bucks, mama, it's, it's it, mama, you just, you're cool. You're one of my favorite, like people that it just make me smile. The stuff you send in. So, uh, thanks for, thanks for doing a review here too. That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah. It is. It is neat when people like follow you from show to show. And, uh, you know, like you just, you, you wreck it like our friend wash, you know, our friend wash has been around for, for a while. Uh, he's a super cool dude. Um, and by the, you know, what else is really cool is when like, you're, you're just walking in a crowd and you're talking and the person in front of you, like perks up and like turns around and looks at you and they're like, I know your voice, right? Yeah. Are you like, that's the weirdest thing to me. And it's awesome. Every time it happens. And listen, if you ever recognize my voice out there, Please feel free to turn around and say hi. I'm cool with it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It is an amazing thing when that happens. Yeah. It's a little weird sometimes. I get nervous because my voice was in a lot of places, and it's just like, like I know your voice. I'm like, where from? <laughs> where? <laughs> what? Were you wired? What's this about me? to turn? Yeah, what's this about to turn into? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, hey Jeff, uh, you know, along with our rule of three, along with reading our uh, reviews and comments from our great listeners out there. Uh, we like to play games and we like to another game. We like to play, try that again. Uh, well, Hey Jeff, you know, along with our rule of three, uh, and reading reviews and things like that. One of the other games that we like to play on this show is when we get to the end of the episode, we take a look at next week's episode title. And that's all we've ever seen out of it is the title. And we try to guess what next week's episode is going to be about based on that title alone. Sometimes we're ridiculously close and other times we're ridiculously far away. Now's the time to find out just how close or far away we were. So Jeff, do you remember what you said? Whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi was going to be about and how close were you? So I thought the big sting on this was going to be that we weren't going to see Garibaldi at all in this one. And for most of the episode, we didn't, but then, uh, then we got a big, big little reveal going with him, but I thought this was mostly going to be Jakar running around, trying to figure out what happened to Garibaldi pretty much nailed that piece. Uh, how about you? How'd you do? Well, I said that this was going to be, uh, literally all about Garibaldi and it was literally going to be like his story. And we probably weren't going to see too many of the other people because when we last saw him, Sheridan had given him a job, didn't tell us what it was, made it a big secret, said he couldn't tell anybody, sent him out in a Star of Fury, and he attached his Star of Fury to a shadow ship. 
or he got swallowed up by the shadow ship. One of the two, I couldn't really tell which, and that's the last we saw of him. And this is this to me was the episode where we were gonna track his story wherever he went. And honestly, in the Lord of the Rings kind of a way, the the crew splits, like the Fellowship of the Rings split, and we track with each of the different stories as we go through. Um, uh, my my thought was it was gonna be through the season, honestly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that's not at all at all what this episode was about it was not but you want to know what this episode was about are you curious have we piqued your curiosity in any way have you not watched this in like 25 30 years did you just watch it the other day and you're curious what our take is on it maybe it is because that's why you're listening to this brent will you do myself our viewers and our listeners a huge solid and walk us through whatever happened to mr garibaldi well, hey, you remember that weird guy way down with Sheridan and that I'll try that again. Well, hey, you remember that weird guy with Sheridan way down in that hole? Well, it turns out he has a name and his name is Lorian as in Loth Lorian as in the forest. And also not only that, but he is also the first one. No, 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 not a first one. The first one as in father of all like everyone as in god and he really doesn't like to see his children that's the vorlons and the shadows and you and me and the mimbari and everybody he doesn't like to see us fighting and as for sheridan well maybe he's dead maybe he's still falling maybe he's caught in a moment between moments Maybe he is simply caught between life and death. Wherever he is, Sheridan wants out. And this guy, Lorian, knows the way, but he isn't giving that up because he's now got somebody to talk to. Sheridan is actually the first one to make it this far. The shadows know that Lorian is down in there, which is why they keep coming back to Zaha Doom. They think it's honoring or something like that, but really they don't even know anymore. And the Vorlons, well, They're just scared to die, kind of like Sheridan is. But that's not life, Lorian says. Clinging to life is not living. Lorian says that Sheridan must let go of his life to give in and give in to the current situation in order to be free of it. And finally, as Sheridan does, he finds himself holding on to the one thing that makes life worth living for. Delenn. Speaking of Delenn, Delenn is on a long-term fast, but Dr. Franklin is concerned because after all, Delenn doesn't just have a Mimbari body anymore. She's human now, and this could actually be really dangerous for her. But honestly, I don't think Delenn was listening to Dr. Franklin express this to her at all because she's still caught up on why didn't she tell Sheridan about Anna and her possibly still being alive? Was it because she wanted Sheridan all to herself and now she's responsible for Sheridan going to Zaha Doom? Until she sees a video of Sheridan recording his thoughts on the moment, he realized he was in love with her. And Delenn decides that's it. She is going to mount a full-scale assault of Zaha Doom, so strap in, boys! And speaking of boys, Marcus Cole and Jakar are off to find Mr. Garibaldi. They don't have much to go on, but they do wind up in a bar somewhere and some dirty, rotten rat sells out Jakar to the Centauri and Jakar gets captured and taken back to Centauri prime. Emperor Cartagia summons Londo, who is shocked to see Jakar, who is being given to Londo as a surprise present by Cartagia. Later, when they're alone, Jakar and Londo have a conversation. Londo tells Jakar about his plan to off the Mad Emperor, but he needs Jakar's help. Now, Jakar is going to have to endure whatever the Emperor is getting ready to do to him. Londo is just going to have to watch. And when the time is right, Jakar is going to help Londo kill Emperor Cartagia. And in exchange for this, Londo will ensure that the Narn are set free once again. 
Now, all of that, and we haven't even talked about Mr. Garibaldi, and the name of this episode is where or whatever. Now, after all of that, we haven't even talked about Mr. Garibaldi, and the whole name of this episode is whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi. Well, turns out he was captured and put into a holding cell, apparently a sidecore holding cell at that. That's it. One minute and 40 seconds of screen time, and the entire episode was named after that. The end. Jeff, what did you think of this episode? Whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi? Dude, this was dark. This was a really, really dark episode. Like, I, I think I've come to expect that, you know, so from time to time with, uh, come to expect that from time to time with Babylon 5. Like, it's not an unheard of thing, but holy crud. Uh, but, but nothing shocking again. Like, I mean, that's not true. There's a lot shocking when we talk about, uh, Lothlorien, excuse me, Lorien. <laughs> Cause yep. I got that too. But, uh, this is the, the we're on the rails. Like we're, we're rolling. Things are moving. We're going to have some extra context, you know, added along the way. But I think like we're, we're strapped in for the ride. Jakar ending up captured on Centauri prime, not a shock, right? Like this, this was likely going to, mm-hmm. going to be a place we were going to end up, we saw him, you know, show up in that future place in War Without End. You said Lorian might be God, essentially. I have very different thoughts. We have a lot to talk about <laughs> with Lorian. Um, I look forward to. I'm going to address this directly to people out there. Um, I really liked Dr. Franklin in this episode. I thought he was great. I thought he was perfect. Basically. Uh, I really, really liked him in this one, but oh my God, you want to talk about symbolism? You want to talk about sorry, bonk, real bonk quick, on Jeff, the head? Jeff, Jeff, oh yeah. Ask me how many notes I have about Dr. Franklin in my, in my, my whole thing here. Hey Brent, how many notes do you have about Dr. Franklin? Not a single one. Really? Not a one. Go ahead. You I probably have, have three. Several. You have three. I have three. Yeah, I don't have one. Three. Because I am capable of looking past my biases and judging someone on their performance and their objective behavior. But hey, I barely talk- noticed him in this episode. Maybe part Bare- of the reason I liked him. Man, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody loves Brussels sprouts. If you only have to eat part of one, you know. I mean, it's not that bad. No, I, I still don't like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I love them. Actually, I really love Brussels sprouts, but this, I, 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 gosh, I mean, Jakar strung with the cross, you know, the carrying the timber as he walks, literally walking the stations of the cross. Like we, we are at the first station right now with Jakar and it is, oh, it is so good. In fact, we'll talk about it in detail, but I would like right now, um, in retrospective, whatever thing to submit my nomination for Peter Jurisic, uh, for, uh, Emmy for outstanding dramatic performance in a science fiction, uh, thing. Cause holy crud, he brought it in this episode. What about you? What were your first reactions? Well, the, the first thing that I think I need to say, Jeff is happy anniversary to you and Mrs. Jeff. Thank you for that. It I is, appreciate it that. It is that time of year for you guys. So it happy is. anniversary it's always, to you guys. Always a fun time. Thank you. Um, this is an episode where we are still dealing with the fallout of what happened at the end of season three. Not everybody's back on the station yet. We're not back to life as, as normal, which usually you get to by like episode two or three, Mm -hmm. but we're not there yet. This is going to carry on. I don't see Jakar and probably Londo coming back to the station, uh, very often, if at all for the remainder of this season, anyway, at least not, at least not in the foreseeable future. Yeah. I could see Jakar never stepping foot on Babylon five again. Like, yeah. That's a very realistic path right now. Yeah. Um, I thought right up until the very end, we might not see Sheridan back on Babylon on, on Babylon five. I think now we have a really good chance of seeing him back on Babylon five. Um, uh, presuming that whatever this assault that Delenn's about to lead is, you know, going to be effective in rescuing him. However, that works because 
Jeff, I, we got to talk. I got some questions we got to talk about. Like, yeah. where the what the heck is this whole thing? We'll we'll get yeah. there. Um, this is not an episode that I can sit back and say I loved. Okay, this is not an episode that like when we get to the end of Babylon Five, and I'm thinking back to, man, that was a good episode. Am I going to remember this episode? In fact, I venture to say by the time we get halfway through the season and we're doing rankings and be like, wait. What what happened to whatever happened, to Mr. Garibaldi? Oh yeah, it was all that stuff. Everything that happened in this episode, though, was important. Mm -hmm. There was nothing wasted in this episode. I don't know that cohesively, like it makes a great episode, but every bit of it was so good. Probably the best thing to me, though, is for the first time in a long time, Jeff. We got Londo and Jakar in a room talking. And once again, they stole the episode. Yeah. Now, the whole stuff with Sheridan and Lorian, I dug. I loved that whole bit. But Jakar and Londo, there's just something so strong about those two together. And I was thinking about this the other day. A while back, Jeff. A while back. Like maybe a year ago at this point. Um, our friends over at the gray 17 podcast had Peter Jurassic as a, mm-hmm. uh, as a guest on one of their shows. Yeah. And you know, I'm listening and, and a lot of the questions somehow revolved around, uh, Peter and his relationship with Andreas. But I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, you know, Peter actually spent a lot more time with Steven first than he did with Andreas. Yeah. It, I mean, more. now I don't know what's coming up here in the last two seasons for Londo and Jakar and how much time they're going to be together, but we haven't really seen Londo and Jakar on screen together since really season one. Well, we saw in a friendly way. I think the last time we saw them together was dust to dust, which was the elevator scene, right? No, that was convictions. Okay. Was that, and then dust to dust was, was when where he snorted Jakar, up and like, then he would beat, the beat him with an inch. Crap yeah. out of him, right? Yeah. Um, and then, but then there was, there was the elevator scene. And then before that it was, it was just a couple of small moments. But you remember that episode, that season one, like it was just Londo and Jakar rubbing against each other and stealing every scene that they were in together, mm-hmm. you know? So, good. um, this is like one of the first time we just haven't had that in so long. And, but I was thinking like with Steven first, like what was his relationship like with Steven? Yeah. You know? Um, and I, be, I like, I'd, I'd be interested because everybody always asks about the, the Londo and, and Andreas, the Peter and Andreas, but, but I wanted that. I can see out of this episode why it's the Londo and Jakar relationship that stands out because there is like Peter is at his very best as an actor when it's Andreas across the way. That's taking nothing away from Steven. I'm taking nothing away from Bruce or Mira or, um, uh, Jerry or or anybody, anybody, I'm not taking anything away from any of them. But when Andreas is the one who's across the room from him. Peter just elevates all the way around. And it was, it was so good to see that. Um, I loved the conversation. Like I said, that Lorian and Sheridan had with each other, uh, the, the Delenn stuff, you know, her, her and Sheridan having come to the realization that they both love each other now being able to voice it to each other in various ways. And being able to step out in that love and act as a part of what that love is, is super compelling to me. Yeah. yeah. Even, even if it's, even if what they're doing, and in this case, Mira, like rallying the, the, the Rangers to go off on a weird, you know, rescue mission. And they're all like, wait, we're going where, um, even if it's that like, like her reasoning for doing so, like I, I find so much of this really, really compelling. Um, what is it we've been saying? I think in a couple episodes, Jeff, this might be an episode where the, the parts are greater than the sum, Mm, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And that that's, that's, I think where I'm going to stay with it. I think the parts of this episode are greater than the whole. 
because there were very different episodes in yeah. this episode, right? Yeah. There was the Jakar and Marcus thing that was its own fun little episode, you know, episode mm-hmm. in and of itself. There was the Delenn going through her stuff that was an mm-hmm. episode. Then there was the Jakar and Londo thing that was an episode. Mm-hmm. And then you had the the Sheridan and Lorian yeah. stuff. Like these were not connected. Hey, the fellowship is worked. broken up and they're all doing their own thing right now. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. That that all ties together way up here. Yeah. It's there, but we're looking at the pieces right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I would be really okay, Jeff, if we never got everybody back on Babylon five and we go, okay, what's Tuesday like on Babylon five right now? Now, like yeah. I'm okay to not have that episode because I don't, I don't think you can have that episode really. Mm-hmm. Can't go back, you know, can't go back again. I don't see well, or, and I don't see where, like, I don't see Londo and Jakar on Babylon five. You know what I mean? Like I, like I said, I don't see Jakar there, but th- they can't ever be together. Cause th- right. this has a very natural progression and we've seen the end of this Yeah, where, I mean, Jakar is going to go through hell. Londo is going to go through hell having to watch him do this. In fact, what I'm looking forward to is watching their relationship, their ah, relationships, not a strong enough word, their bond, watching mm-hmm. their bond grow through the shared trauma of what's going on. Right. Mm-hmm. I think they're both so great with the face acting, even through the makeup. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot of, yeah. you know, Jakar and we- torment and Londo and torment. Can we give credit to the makeup team, particularly those who worked on the Jakar character Mm. to, uh, to do the makeup in such a way as to allow the facial expressions of Andreas to come through because I mean, frankly, through the latex and star Trek so often, we really can't ever see that. Exactly. I think that we, I, we think of, of, of him as a uh, Tomalock, right? Yeah. Where he's a Romulan and that's not a lot. It's yeah. not a lot of makeup on there, but it was enough that it was stifling. Like I get more facial emotion and reaction from Andreas Katsalas under all that Garibaldi makeup or sorry, all that Jakar makeup. Right. It's the hat. It's the, the Garibaldi hat that he had there. Then I ever did as Tomalock with the Romulan stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Jeff, with that, wh- let's talk about Jakar. Let's let's track his storyline and and kind of get through him. So he goes off on a mission to find Garibaldi. Yeah, like that's that's what he wants. Why does he want to go find Garibaldi? Because he's got a Friend. cool hat and he wants to get him back. Like <laughs> he's become his buddy, I guess. Like. It's his it dear touching. good friend, Mr. Garibaldi. Oh, wait, Roger. I've never, I've never had a friend before who wasn't Narn, he says. And it was just like, that's pretty powerful. Also says a lot about how he sees his relationship with everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he goes off and Marcus is there to not watch his back, apparently. <laughs> like there was, okay. First, let me say I enjoyed this whole uh-huh. thing with them on the planet and the, you know, trying to like, I got this piece of a star theory. Tell me what it means. Tell me what it means. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed all of it. Also, it kind of doesn't hold up. <laughs> so I'm Jakar, uh-huh. the last of the Kari. I mm-hmm. know I'm wanted. I know I'm a dead man. The second I walk off the station. So what do I do? I go to a planet that is clearly controlled by the centauri because they're walking around in their little gold hats and stuff which by the way looks goofy as dumb hell. dumb now just i dumb. don't i don't know if the british redcoats back in the 1700s looked that stupid to the people of their day but these guys looked like these are not intimidating fellas not to me it, it might have been it might have been around the time this episode aired my high school got rid of the, the marching band uniforms that i wore when i went <laughs> ah! there <laughs> I wonder if they sent him down. That's what it looked like, Jeff. That's one hundred percent what it looked like. Totally, yeah. Oh, I, if it was, I feel bad for him. Those things smelled terrible. <laughs> but but not only does he does he go to this to, to the lion's den almost, uh-huh. but he doesn't even change his clothes. He's wearing right. like look look at me in my spiky jacar coat. Like hi, this is right. this is who I am. And then to fast forward a little bit, when Marcus is like basically, hey, I'll take the first watch or whatever. He's like, no just leave like i got the, and marcus what? leaves when have you ever seen marcus just leave that was Never. so out of character for him yeah. 
Because normally he's like, okay, yeah, I'll go. And then what does he do? He like goes and hides up in the rafters. Exactly. And then or just stays down right was, when he needs you. Like, he was in that little like that hut or whatever. He, yeah. He'd leave and then just kind of tuck away or something. Yeah, yeah this did not, uh, this actually, whole sequence yeah. didn't add up. To but it, narratively, we needed it because we needed Jakar to get captured to go to Centauri Prime. Well, it makes like, me wonder, right? It makes me wonder. Yeah. My question is, did he know this? Was this? It can't be part of the plan, right? But was part no. of his plan to go? Like, did he know this was going to happen somehow? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Because yeah, that was the first thing he asked Emperor Kartashi. <laughs> He's still looking for him. But yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it was part of the plan. I, I will say um, something I never knew that I needed to see, and frankly, I'd be glad to never ever see it again. Is Jakar brushing his teeth with his finger? Yeah, what was that with his glove on? He was brushing his teeth, man. Yeah. That's what he was doing. <laughs> was like, like, were there bristles on that glove? Uh, Is that? Nope. I think he was just brushing his I mean, how did they brush teeth back before toothbrushes? Yeah. They chew on stuff or, you know. Get the fingers up in there. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Also, um, when Jakar looks at, at Marcus and tells him, like, he's going to be offended if he doesn't leave, um, having seen what I've seen of the Narn, there is nothing scary about the phrase there's nothing more inherently dangerous than an offended non i think i can take you yeah i've seen a lot of you fight and yeah. it's not it's not anything impressive no like no, no not i mean you get a group of you together with a gospel yeah. singer and yeah yeah you yeah. watch out there's one of you and you're frankly an old guy so right I, and i have this really cool uh, right and and that, yeah and i'm a badass fighter like right, right. i just took out narun like yeah. yeah no um this was though this was I, I i realized when i was watching this that this moment that mm -hmm. that bar fight is the that's why we had to watch that avalon episode it was all that scene where jakar Marcus and King Arthur were fighting the thugs and down below was all to make a natural progression for them to just be the ultimate fighting machine together. I, I call false. I'm just trying. I'm trying to connect <laughs> some dot to that thing. <laughs> that was no, that, that episode just did not need to exist. That was, Hey, I got 21 ideas. I need one more, right? That's all that King is. King Arthur, sort of. That's all that is. Uh, so Jakar gets captured and taken back to uh centauri prime and the emperor calls for londo in the middle of the night um and he rings his teeny tiny little bell i loved the his bell little, teeny tiny little bell and he's got his little teeny tiny hair crust uh which by the way londo comes in and and he's you know getting ready and just sweet talking the emperor oh. and he's like yeah hey, whatever but have, have you noticed uh londo's getting a little gray yeah around, yeah around the crest yeah, he's letting uh because like when back around coming of shadows and and that kind of run through in the second season up to the fall of night uh -huh. he was going like dying his hair all oh he black. was oh yeah hard yeah, yeah like yeah. he was just for men you know at that right. point and the the black jacket and the oh, noir man. midnight number 12. yeah like, that yeah was it's like what's yeah. what's the highest number you got on this let's right. do that and now like he's kind of letting himself go a little on at your all Mm -hmm. But he he was so good with yeah. Cartagia, like, and 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 I felt like because he said something, you know, there he's like, you were late, and so I'm, you know, but you have a good excuse, so I'm not going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And then he gets up and he's like, I like you, I really like you, mm -hmm. and I was like, he does because game recognized game. He's literally just like, you and me, we mm -hmm. are going to hate each other horribly but we're never going to be able to touch each other. Right. And like, he knows that, you know, I think oh, it's, it's fun. Yeah. Um, so uh, fast forward, they do the whole thing. I don't know if you want to talk about anything else in that, in that room, but that, the, I got to talk about the conversation between Londo and Jakar back in the cell. Um, did you have anything else from that, from that throne room scene real quick? You want to touch on before not from the throne room scene. Just okay. you said it. I loved the little bell more than I should have, right. but it was perfect for right. him. Right. And you already referenced the, the timbers and, and all that sort of stuff, yeah. uh, which I noticed lots of that. Um, okay. First of all, on the floor of Jakar's cell, did you, was there some sort of like pool of blood or bodily fluid, like right in the middle of the, something kind of wet. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or, Maybe his own 
excretions or whatever. something. Yeah. Well, because that's the thing, a little sidetrack there. They never talk about in movies or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah we put him in this cell. We left him there for six days. Uh, I didn't see a bucket in the scene. Yeah. Like, what's, what's going on? Right. Right. Um, so Londo going through in agonizing detail of what they're going to do to him. Talking about cutting him from here to here and piling his organs up if he's still alive or if not, they don't care. And, and, and Jakar asks him a real interesting question. Does this please you? Yeah. And Londo goes, no, no. And he goes, once long ago, no, not even then. And I thought that was such an interesting confession that Londo needed to hear himself say, yeah, you know, like he needed to come like, no, that's not ever what I really wanted. It's like, I hate you. I want to see you crushed under my boot heel, but also I want to see you stand up with some dignity and like, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to pardon, pardon the phrase. This is really insensitive, but I want to beat you like a man. Right. Yeah. I think is where he kind of landed. He doesn't want this. This is, yeah, this is, this is not where he was. This is not truly what he wanted. And, and I mean, this really recalled to me those phrases of uh, Londo saying, and I forgot how to dance, mm, mm -hmm. you know, or he's in bed with uh, what, what's, what's the lady he fell in love with? Uh, Ladira or Adira. 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 You know, and he's like, you know, it's, it's all about position. Everybody wants, like he, he's coming back to that Londo. Mm -hmm. um and he and he puts it he puts it to jakar like i'm gonna kill him and you're gonna do this yeah and jakar's like well you're gonna do this for me and you, well, you don't have room to negotiate well neither do you and yes we will set narn free to kill emperor cartagia and make this happen but londo's like you're gonna have to endure a lot and i'm gonna have to just sit there and watch oh. yeah it's going to be, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for us to watch. I think, yeah. but I also think I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. I look forward to the, just the incredible acting that is going to happen through that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I do believe that what we saw in war without end, when they finally strangle each other, you know, was where he came out and he greeted him as an old friend Yeah, and asked him to, you know, do this favor for him. They're going to develop this strong bond through their suffering together. I don't think he's going to be a friend. No, no. I, I think that Londo and Jakar, at least from what I gathered from watching that future piece, they're still enemies, mm -hmm. but you mentioned there is a bond and there is a mutual respect and there is a, a, a partnership, but I don't know that it ever actually becomes friendship. And I'll be sense. interested to see if you're right or I'm right. Cause it'd, it'd be cool if it became a friendship. I honestly think it'd be a little cooler if there was always this enmity, always this, this, uh, this beef between them, but there was also still a, a, a mutual respect. And you know, who I think of when I think of this, I think of, of captain Kirk and balance, of, Romulan, terror, right? balance of terror yes. and the Romulan and there's like, we could have been friends except he was just born over there. And I was born over here. Like those guys could, could be just the perfect, uh, uh, frenemies i hate that phrase but it's exactly the right word jeff it's kind of perfect it's too it is but yeah so i think from here we're gonna see i think we're gonna see a version of jakar going through the stations of the cross and if people aren't familiar stations of the cross is something that catholics celebrate during the season of lent leading up to year, uh, to, to Easter. And it's where it's 14, there are 14 stations where essentially you go through and pray through the steps that Jesus went through from being condemned to death through the scourging of the pillar and having to carry his cross all the way to his, to his death in there. And so, yeah, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish what you're saying. <clears throat> I was just going to dive into kind of what the, some of those things are. So we're going to, we're going to see him. We saw him condemned to death. Basically we saw him carry his cross. We're going to see him fall. We're going to see him meet uh, someone that's important to him. We're going to see someone come and help him. Uh, we're going to see him fall again. And we're going to see him again, meet other people that matter. But then they're, we're going to see basically the, the end of him where he's going to, they're going to divide up his, his, his clothes, cast lots 
for all of his belongings and then they're going to get ready to kill him. And that's when Londo's going to give the go ahead mm -hmm. and flip the whole thing on its head. Yeah. Or what if they actually quote unquote kill him and Jakar somewhere somehow resurrects or something. So like I, I, I didn't want to say it cause it's like, it, it, it's so on the, on the nose right now that yeah. like, I feel like that would be easy to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, that's the easy way to do it. And I kind of hope it doesn't happen that way. Well, I mean, cause we, we'll talk about this more in just a moment, but did we kind of see Sheridan just resurrect from the dead? I think we did. I mean, do we just establish that that happens in this world and in this universe? We'll talk about that. Jeff, I need you to make me a promise though. I'll do my best. Okay, you are far more familiar with the stations of the cross than I am. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not Catholic. I wasn't born and raised in that. Um, but I've always, you know, it certainly is a background for me, uh, on the, the more Protestant side. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to track that oh, yeah. story. And just point it out in future episodes as we go. So this is where this was, and this is where this was, and this is where that piece was, and see if you're right. Yeah. Because you, I mean, you could be completely wrong, and that could not be what Jakar goes through at all. But I would, I there's a piece of me that would love for that metaphor to exist here, and if it is, I would love for you to point it out. Cool. I am on. I'm. I am on the case. There you go. Um. So that's all I had on Jakar and Londo. Yeah, that's about what I had as well. Let me just make sure. Yeah. All right. Do you want to talk about uh, Delenn? I want to talk about Delenn real quick. I had two notes yeah. for her. A one, so she's fasting over her guilt. There you go. Okay. She feels really guilty, so she can't eat. Uh, I had a hard time with the entire Delenn thing. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I forget which episode it was last season. It was the one where they were trying to like locate the pattern of attack with the shadows. Uh, she and Sheridan were, and I was just like, God, she's, she's just fallen into kind of that traditional female gender stereotype role of a relationship in, in a lot of ways. And I, and I feel like this was like a further slip away from her. Just, I get that when someone you love, when you lose someone you love, there's a period where you're blaming yourself. And I can, and I can get for her that there's some, there's some real one-to-one -one relationship on, I did this that led to this kind of stuff. Also, I feel like we spent the better part of three seasons establishing how wise she was. Like I remember back in the first season when we would have entire Delta conversations based on two lines that she said, mm -hmm. like she was this very wise. Don't hear me say, ah, you move through trauma and whatever. It's not what I'm saying, but I feel like she has more wisdom than to basically resign herself to death because she's beaten herself up over this. It just didn't, I don't think it fit her character. Yeah. I, I would, I hear everything you're saying, but I would come back at you with saying it actually might be one of the most human things she could do hmm. because people do stupid stuff for love. People do yeah. stuff for, for love, for guilt. That is way outside the norm of who they tend to be. Um, it's true. Uh, and, and that could also go positive as well. People do a whole mm -hmm. lot of real positive stuff at, for the sake of love. Um, I would also say that, that she possibly, probably has never really experienced these feelings before. And she's trying to deal with them for the first time. And just because she's wise, now she's got to figure out how does that work within like a human emotional concept. Yeah, yeah. How does how does she deal with that? So um I I didn't mind that so much. I it, and you talk about the gender stereotype that she falls into. Help me process this. Okay. Because there's a piece of me that goes, I hear what you're saying. Stereotypes exist for a reason though. Right? And Delin, Delin is female. Mm -hmm. You know, I know she was she was meant to be androgynous. You guys can save the comments. We know, but she is female, and she is meant to be female. So to to fall into uh, certain stereotypes that are that are of the female sex, like I don't know that that's inherently a bad thing. Does that you know like yeah? I don't, I mean, and I don't think it puts her in the weak category or anything of that nature it, it just uh 
I think it just doesn't jive with the, her character necessarily. To, to mm -hmm. and it's not even being the female stereotype. To me, it uh -huh. doesn't jive with her character to fall into a stereotype, like especially in terms of a relationship. Yeah. Like, like oh, I'm going to play this role in the relationship. No, you are Satai. You are going to be the the head of the Gray Council. Yeah, and you're just going to fall into a traditional relationship role all of a sudden. Right. That's the piece that it kind of doesn't check for me. Well, but then she gets all pissed off when she realizes, you know, what's what she gets empowered. She sees the video and like, oh, this is what it was. And and now I'm going to act that. And I, I actually really kind of dug it. Like she's going to find herself, the best parts of herself. And she goes and calls all the Rangers together. Not all, but all the ones that are on the station anyway, uh, calls the Rangers together, which by the way, I always forget that the Rangers are a thousand years old. Because in my mind, it's really something that Sinclair created when he got sent to Minbar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that it's actually a new organization, that it's not this big old organization. In my mind, that's how it works. Technically, it is something Sinclair started when he got sent to Minbar. Sure. It's just a different time. I understand that. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Um, but she rallies him and she's like, we're going to go do this. And Jeff, I was curious in her sort of vision casting rallying speech to her folks of saying this is the plan and this is where we're going to go do how did what did you make of that from a leadership standpoint i had to check myself a couple times because at first i was just like i i would have outed four sentences into what she was saying just been like oh where's the restroom i gotta yikes let me leave my pen right here this this lady's out of her mind but then i had to remind myself this was a team of rangers people who've been through intense training and have done things mm -hmm. we live for the one we die for the one right right that's the culture of the rangers so she spoke to them as individuals she spoke to their culture as rangers i thought it was an incredible incredible rallying cry once i reminded myself of who she was talking to and she is the one she is they exactly. live for her and they die for her mm -hmm. they're gonna go do it like it or not uh was she abusing her position i think so and and and, th and so the note i actually have here is this is the first time i've truly felt the loss of old kosh because I feel like old Kosh and her, the scene would have been different where she's like, I'm going to get the Rangers and we're going to this. And he would just be like, no, no. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, you know, and, and basically just begged her off of the whole thing. This isn't the way to go. This isn't the right thing. Sheridan has opened an unexpected door. You need to stop. Cause this, I don't think, in fact, I have predictions for the next episode, but I don't think this is going to go well. This, yeah. this whole attack. So you mentioned Kosh and you mentioned what Kosh is thinking and what Kosh is saying. I don't think this is going to go well. We're going to stop. We're going to do this. Kosh is brought up a whole lot in the conversation between Sheridan and Lorian. Mm -hmm. And Lorian's like, yo, look, Kosh was not, he's clinging to life and he shouldn't be. Um, this whole conversation, are you okay transitioning to this? Yeah, I just, the only, I had a couple super quick final thoughts and yeah. it's, it was really on Franklin. I mentioned I had some notes and I just, I really want to bang this on the door for people. Old Franklin, uh -huh. old Franklin would have tried to talk her down when he came in and was like, look, like you really should eat. You're not just a Minbari anymore. You've got human stuff as well. Old Franklin would have he would have done something. He would have found a way to get her food. Instead, he handed her the facts and then he walked away. And then later when he was going through Sheridan's gear, he handed her the data crystal and he walked away. He's just like, I'm just going to show you what you already know and let you put these pieces together. I, I am really impressed with this step, uh, this step for, for Dr. Franklin. And I had a, an acting thought as well. Mm -hmm. The video, and I and I am a hundred percent sure you're going to talk about the line from the video of Sheridan when you do your closing thoughts, because uh, it was amazing, right? If you uh, find yourself falling off a cliff, might as well try and fly. Oh, that's so good. When Bruce Boxleitner was recording that that log, right? Mm -hmm. I want to know: Was Mira Furlan? Was he looking at her? Like, was she in the room when he did that? Or did he have a picture of someone in his personal life? Like, did he have a picture of Melissa Gilbert up or maybe a younger sweetheart from before or something? Cause it was so real. 
when he like that was so well done and that's a trick i've used in voice acting where i'll have a picture of someone and i'll look at that and mm -hmm. and speak to it and i'm curious if he did something did something similar because it was just that was a really really well done scene so my understanding of how they filmed those scenes where people are on screen um i know you and i have often said well you and i have often said that like oh you can tell that that's filmed off somewhere in a corner and you've just got like a director like pause 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 go my understanding is the way they they actually filmed that is they had these guys on set over here they had that person in a set over there and they actually were talking back and forth mm -hmm. and the pause was just however long it took to transmit and for that person to hear and see it's kind of like what you see on a newscast sometimes that big awkward pause so um i don't i don't know but I think that just goes to talk about how great of an actor Bruce Boxleitner is. Uh, can I just say that it was very clear to me that he recorded that particular uh, uh, piece now in season four with whatever this new hairstyle is that he has going on and not yes. back in season three when it supposedly yes. was recorded. <laughs> yes, it's very clear. I mean, this, this would be like, uh, I don't know uh jonathan frakes recording a bit from season one but he still has the beard like you're right like, all of that a sudden. doesn't quite work you know that's three i'm okay with that you're out i'm okay let's talk about sheridan and lorian yeah so i at the risk of going through every line by line by line um a couple of things jump out yeah. One, there's this big light thing that is has two arms attaching into Sheridan, and he's asked two questions again and again. Who are you and what do you want? Who are you and what do you want? Who are you and what do you want? Now, what do you want should ring a big old freaking line to all of us who've been watching Babylon 5 for this amount of time. Same with who are you at this point. Now, where is the who are you? Because Do we That's hear a, the Vorlon say that quite a bit? Sebastian uh, and comes the Inquisitor. <laughs> Oh yeah. Ask that. And then we, and then okay. Lorian busted that out at the end of the last episode where he yeah. Oh, well, sure he did. Who are yeah. You? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Jeff, I had a theory a long time ago that the Vorlons and shadows were the same thing. Two sides of the same coin, light and dark, a yin and mm -hmm. a yang, uh, uh, that's type of deal. And I kind of pushed that off to the side. I want to bring that back because I think I might be right. And we're there. there, so I compare it in my recap, Lorian to being God. Now, I don't think that Lorian is the, like, when you think of the idea, the, the Judeo-Christian idea of God, who is this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent being, I don't think that's what Lorian is. But this idea of like, I am the first one. I am the uncaused first cause. I, all of these are my children and I, mm -hmm. I hate to see them fighting and, for whatever reason, the shadows keep come, come, trying to come get me. And there's this hole. And Jeff, I've got to ask, what is this hole? Where are we? Are we actually on Zaha Doom? Is this a portal somewhere else? Are we going into a different realm? What the, is this even a construct of Sheridan's mind and not something that is real? Where the freak are we? But yet, uh, what this made me think of is... Uh, when you, when you go back to the, to the early days of the Bible, when it talks about the creation of man and woman, and it, and it says that, that God made them male and female, and he, he gave them, them both attributes of him. And there are some attributes that went to men and there are some attributes that went meant to women. And yes, we tend to use the male pronoun in reference to God, but the idea that, that God has all of these attributes together in one, and it's not split. The idea that Lorian can do the, what do you want and who are you? And he, and he says at one point, you've got to be able to say yes to both. You've got to be able to make peace with both, not just one or the other. And he calls out Kosh uh -huh. for saying, look, you're not even doing it all the way. Right. Kosh, you big angel out there. You got angels and demons. That's the shadows or the demons. You got the angels, angels and demons are supposed to be of the same ilk. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think shadow I'm back on the Vorlons and shadows are the same thing, just of two sides of the same coin, uh, going at it from two different ways. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think so. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna dive pretty deep here. So please do put the face mask on or whatever so you can continue breathing oxygen. So threes threes are a big thing in Babylon Five, right? Mm-hmm. There's uh, the Minbari, all the stuff. We had Zathras really breaking it down. There are three ones, all the stuff. There were three questions that Lorian qu- kept asking. Mm-hmm. He's asking, who are you? What do you want? And why are you here? Yeah. So those were the three. He added another one. So you have the Vorlons who yep. took the, who are you? You have the shadows who took, what do you want? And he somewhere, somewhere were other first ones or someone else who had the, why are you here? He's the last one that we know of holding on to that. So when I think three, because I'm Catholic and because I've been watching Babylon five and I know JMS is not afraid to write in this vein, three is a really big number, right? And so the gospel, according to John begins with this kind of breakdown of what is the basis for the Trinity. And it starts, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning and through him, all things were made. Nothing came into being except through him. So basically God and the word are the same. Now in the Bible and in the Catholic tradition, we go on to know that the word becomes the burning bush for Moses. And then the word becomes flesh in Jesus. And all this comes together through the spirit. I think that Lorian is the first, the first one, but I think he was part of a group. Like, I think he's like maybe the last of the first ones that were, Mm. these are our angels. So we have whatever deity God that exists. Mm -hmm. And then he created through the word, through himself, he created angels. Like that's stuff that's there, you know, and there's angels going, then there's the tradition that Lucifer says, I'm the most beautiful of all, which led to the fallen angels and Satan and the devils or Satan, depending on how you say it. Mm Mm-hmm. So he created these Lorian people and they went and made things happen. And they had other like hierarchies of things that were, we look at as angels, the cherubim, the seraphim and all those things. And this, they just happened to call them Vorlons and shadows probably used to call them, you know, Tiki gods and party first ones and whatever. And some went away and did their thing. These two split and went in different places. I think that Lorian, Lorian is meant at the the higher level to represent the message of whatever the God, the universe, right? It's the universe in Babylon five is God Mm -hmm. made flesh to bring the three. Who are you? What do you want? Why are you here together into one? That one is going to be Sheridan. That was a really, that was, I went a lot of places. I love every bit about that. that. Um, yeah, I, I, and at the risk of diving too far into the theology of all of it right. and making those comparisons, <laughs> and that's probably a whole different podcast in and of itself. Uh, but I, I love the idea that Lorian is a representative of the Trinity. Uh, I, I would, You said maybe he's the last of one. Uh, listen, Jeff, with the Trinity, only one of the three members of the Trinity was in the form of human. Yep to be seen and interacted with on the physical plane. So maybe not that the one, last one, but just he the, was the one of that the form. one. And, and that was, one yeah. in, in the, in, in Catholicism, like in the Catholic tradition was the word. When you yeah. say the word of the Lord, that's Jesus. Exactly. Right. And so that's in, in the word of the universe is Lorian. Yeah. And I, you know, I didn't even think about the idea that the, there are different types of angels that are out there with the cherubim and the seraphim. And when we talk about the, the ancient ones, there was the first ones and then the, the ancient ones that those ancient ones that existed before would be angels and demons and, and they have their deal. And then the, the, the people are created and they come into it. Now you're talking about the Minbar and the Nard and the earthlings mm-hmm. and the Centauri and all of, you know, uh, like all of that tracks. And, and it seems like that's a lot of where JMS is, is kind of going. And, and you look at the Lord of the Rings stuff. Okay. Let's go with that. I don't know that there is a particular, uh, God figure in Lord of the Rings, but you definitely have, um, you, you have the elves and then you have, 
uh, Sauron and the orcs and what's going on there. The wizards. Oh, you have the wizards that that are getting involved in the whole thing. And then you come down the peg a little bit, and then you've got the men and the men of Rohan and the you know the the fights that they're having amongst themselves, the dwarves and the 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 other elves, I guess, and and the hobbits and mm -hmm. you know it, it that all tracks and makes sense from a narrative and a story point. So my question is this, I've got to ask this question. What is the nature of Zaha doom? Is Zaha doom heaven? Is it, is it limbo? Is it, it you so know, he, he described he about, about being in between, right? It's, yeah. he, he very eloquently it's between the tick and the talk, right? The tick being life and the talk being death. And that was with his big creepy fingers as he literally waved his hands back and forth with the tick and the talk. Mm -hmm. It was a very poetic way of just saying this is the in-between place, which back to Franklin's, or Franklin, back to Sheridan's vision, I think that Lorian is the man in between mm -hmm. that Kosh was pointing him to like, hey, I've been here. You're going to go there and you're going to do better than I did. So, you know, there's the, yeah. the man in between, but I think that this is limbo. It, it's the concept of heaven, the concept of hell. Mm -hmm. Those are Christian thoughts. And there sure. are some other religions within that, you know, Islam and others that care, but you know, for, for Ju Judaism, that's not a thing, you know, for, Hinduism, that's not necessarily a thing for, you know, other ones. So, I mean, that, that we, we think in terms of heaven and hell, but that's a super Western idea, you know, ideology that exists. It makes a lot of sense to believe that if the universe is the deity, essentially, well, then there's the in-between place that exists. Yeah. And I think Zaha Doom is the nexus, the doorway between those places. And that's where he's sitting between the tick yeah. and the talk. Yeah. Cause he, and, and he says the, the shadows continually come back. That's they're, they're drawn back. They don't live here. They're just drawn back here and they think somehow it's respectful to be, to be coming back. And I guess they yeah. get knocked down every once in a while. That was powerful to me. It made me think of Jerusalem is what it made yeah. me think of. Right. So you've got the, you got the strong Jewish presence, the waning Christian presence, and then the, 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 is the Muslim presence in there. And so they, they go there out of respect, right? Out of, but they've forgotten because that's one of the most war torn, you know what I mean? It's like, it's con there's constant battle. It's yeah. unsafe. There's war. And it's like, that's not, that's not the point. It's not the point of this place. And I, I could see Lori and it too. And they come back like, you, you don't even know what you're doing anymore. Mm -hmm. You're just here because you've been doing it for a million years, which I think also describes a lot of religious tradition. <laughs> here you go. So. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty clear. Lorian caught Sheridan. Mm -hmm. He says that, uh, Sheridan has no pulse in this place. Yeah. That was he a doesn't... cool breakdown. Yeah. Shouldn't you be hungry. Shouldn't Don't you yeah. have a pulse? Yeah. None of that stuff. Um, and he gets to a spot and, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this, but he says, you know, you, you're clinging to life. You have a Vorlon inside. You're both clinging to life. You got to let go. And Sheridan's like, I can't let go. I can't let go. You got to let go. It reminded me of yet another Bible verse. He who would cling to his life will lose it. Mm -hmm. You must let it go to save it. Like there, there was, there was that piece, but you have to lay down your burden and surrender yourself to the talk. You're not embracing life. You're fleeing death. So you're caught in between. He says, and he says, and that's not what he, I love this. That's not what your friends need. They need you to be you, not somebody who is scared to be you. You need to just be able to be so that you can do what you got to do and your friends can have the you that you need, you know? And then he, he asked Sheridan to do basically a big trust fall into death's arms. Yep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was great how he said it though. And it really rang a bell for me because he talked about, uh, it's easy to find something worth dying for find something worth living for sure. I feel like I heard that in a Rocky movie once you actually heard it in season one of Babylon five when I forget the episode, but Sinclair did some wild, whatever thing as he often did. And Garibaldi came into his quarters afterwards and he's like, dude, you're looking for a reason to die all mm -hmm. the time. You need to go find a reason to live. There you go. I can't remember which episode it was in, but like 
beat for beat that happened. It was one of those things we, I still ask, right? You know, what yeah. was a Sinclair needed thing? And I wonder if there's, was a through line to this for that. So Sheridan was the first one to make it this far. Yeah. I'm not sure what that means. Exactly. How many others have tried? Have any others tried? Why, what, what is it special about Sheridan? Is there something because Kosh was inside of him that he could make it through? Is yeah, that amalgam yeah. of human and Vorlong yeah. or something? Did did uh, did Lorian just let all the other people fall and go splat? Or yeah, like like I, I don't how know. many people are going to Zaha Doom and jumping down the Sarlacc pit? Like is that <laughs> is that a pilgrimage thing they're doing? Do or? the shadows try to jump down and he right? Like, boost them back out like i don't know i um, think they are i think i think that's part of why that hole exists i still believe like they're like doing some archaeological dig where they think they can physically get back to lorian or whatever like a reverse tower of babel mm -hmm, exactly yeah, yeah because because it's in instead of up and so i think they're right that's going to come up i think pretty soon that's one of my season four predictions it's growing so Jeff, I, I, I sense that we're getting very close to our, our Delta Fury talk before we get there. We have to talk about Garibaldi and what's going on with Garibaldi real quick. Before um, we get there, before we uh -huh. get there. So I, I want, I want to touch on, hold on, let me give myself a clean one really quick. I want to touch on some of the prophecies that Majel Barrett gave to Londo. Cause I Ooh. think, I think we spelled one out here. Okay. And so Lorian, when he's talking to Sheridan says, tells him to step into the abyss before he starts embracing death and everything goes dark for him mm -hmm. in war without end part one, Londo's first line to Sheridan as he wakes up is welcome back from the abyss. I think Sheridan is the one who is already dead. He's already died and this will be Londo's last chance. And that's why uh -huh. between that moment where he says, welcome back from the abyss and he goes off and has his first kiss with the Len and then comes back is when he's like, this is my last chance. I have to let you go. And then I have to, I have to give up what's most important to me and let Jakar kill me. Mm. So maybe pencil mark on this. So uh, because the prophecy said, don't kill the one who is already dead. Mm -hmm. And if, if Sheridan is the one who is already dead, don't kill him. Let him go. Interesting. Interesting. And that would be a moment of redemption for you. Okay. Right. Yep. That's okay. his last moment. And then it was final moment. Of course, is asking Jakar to, to do him in. Yep. Hmm. Good. So Garibaldi. Thanks. Yeah. So the whole episode is titled whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi. And in a minute and 40 seconds, um, he was trapped in a side core cell. Dude, that was an intense hundred seconds. The, the beats, the language, the editing, the room, the set, like everything that was super intense. I thought I don't get this whole piece. Like I I'm, I'm kind of upset with this whole thing right now because Sheridan told Garibaldi, I've got something I need you to do. Garibaldi gets in a star fury. How often have we seen Garibaldi in a star fury in the show? A couple times, not, not many, much. right? Uh, Garibaldi goes out in a star fury. He, in my, uh, the way I read it, he clearly allowed himself to either be captured by a shadow ship or he like secretly s landed on one and was hitching a ride was a stowaway. I'm not sure which way it went. And in and my thought, he was that guy was going to take him back to Zaha Doom or something, and and mm -hmm. he was or whatever's going to happen. But no, that doesn't work. Now he's trapped in a sidecore room with no ceiling doors or walls, like, or he has walls, I guess, just no ceiling or doors, like no, mm -hmm. no, uh, no way out is what I'm saying. There's just no yeah. way out, and I'm like. And this whole episode was how whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi, like that's it. Yeah. We know that's, nothing. What? What? I don't understand. This is, I'm, I'm not convinced it's really Psychor oh, really? that did it either. Cause if it was Psychor, why would they need him to tell him anything? They just read his mind, pull it out of him. Part of me thinks it might be, um, it might be maybe he was wherever he was and then Bester showed up mm. and be, like that's Bester with the mask and boop, boop, pew. He shot his way through, did a, and he's doing a big rescue effort for Garibaldi. Oh, so this and is Bester come to rescue Garibaldi. Uh -huh, yeah, maybe. Is. 
and it's not even a, like they'll find out it's some smugglers or some it's interplanetary expeditions you know trying to do something with him or whatever but what was it that sheridan wanted him to go do and why did he put him in that spot in the whole first place like i don't yeah. understand it doesn't i have no idea yet but i i also i i am of the opinion that he was not expecting that shadow to come and take him that that was the the whole plane went awry when that happened yeah, could, yeah. but i don't but i don't but i don't know could it could go either way but we'll find out right here next week <laughs> so i just jumped maybe because really maybe that is that week. is the thing yeah. but i do think it's time right now that we we've hit that point of this conversation yeah we're going to boil this all down. We're going to see if this episode has any deep morals to it, messages. Maybe it's holding up a mirror to society or giving us hope, beautiful hope that will be better in the future. <laughs> you're going to do that, Brent, by rating this on an ep. Uh, you're going to do this, Brent, by rating this episode on a scale of zero to five Delta Furies as to how strong the message is and just how Babylon 5 it was delivered. So, Jeff, uh, you mentioned earlier, super cool line that Sheridan gives us by his dad. When you're falling off a cliff, you might as well try to fly. I'm not going to touch that one. No, oh, that okay. was that was a cool line that your dad just used to tell you as, as a kid. If you want to touch on that and go off on it, go for it. Well, hey, good there's advice, all of it. Maybe not good advice. Do I know? Yeah, that's it. That's all of it. Yeah, what he said. That's the thing. That's, that's the lesson. Go for it. Right. Now, I'm going to go to something that actually we've touched on a handful of times, and I'm a little surprised to see it continue to come back up throughout the course of Babylon 5, except this is JMS's thing, and he keeps writing it. And it really, to me, comes down to the conversation between Sheridan and Lorian, and it's super in your face in this episode. He says this. The people in your life I'm sorry, let me back up. He says this, your friends need what you can be when you're no longer afraid, when you know who you are and why you are and what you want, when you're no longer looking for reasons to live, but can simply be. Jeff, the people in your life need you to be you they need you to be at your best you're never going to be your best if you're circling the wagons all the time around yourself you're never going to be your best if you don't know who you are you'll never be your best if you're always trying to be something else i think it is the nature of people possibly men, but I think really just sort of people, we all, we have a, a continual search for significance. We look for it in our jobs, in our careers. You look for it in your paycheck. You look for it in what you can provide for your family. You look for it in your influence and your power. And, and, and these, like, that's where you're looking for significance for who you are to define who you are. Those things never satisfy. Those things are never who you are. My son plays chess and not very well. He constantly loses. You want to know why he constantly loses? Because he spends his time positioning his, his because he spends his time positioning his pieces to protect his king. He is not trying to go out and attack and win. He's just trying to not lose. And you can't win that way. I think it's the same thing in life. If you spend your life not knowing who you are, you can't be you. You just have to be you, as simple as that. And that's what the people around you need to be. Folks out there who've been listening for a while may know, I... I'm a stay at home dad. I'm a stay at home dad who is a homeschooling father. And let me tell you what, in my line of work, 99.8% of the people out there are moms, not dads. I go to conferences. I get emails all the time. Hey moms. Hey moms. How are you moms? 
I got to tell you, when I left the workforce, the outside workforce and came home, uh, as a stay at home dad and began homeschooling, I struggled a lot with my identity and who I was and where my value was for my family. And let me tell you, I wasn't the best dad I could be during that time. I was not the best husband I could be at that time because I was constantly worried about who I was. I didn't know who I was because my career was not there for me anymore. The paycheck was not there for me anymore. I, I questioned what, what good am I adding to my family dynamic here? Sure. I could, I could reason it away, but I didn't know it in my heart. I didn't know it in the core of who I was. It took a long time, but I eventually learned that my value to my family laid in me being me, just me. Like that's what my kids need. They just need their dad. That's what my wife needs. She just needs a husband. She doesn't, she doesn't need somebody to come in and fix all of her stuff. She just needs a partner, someone to be there, you know, someone to just love. Frankly, I also needed that. I needed to not be worried about a career and a title and that sort of identity. I have to tell you when I realized that my value never laid in my job, it never laid in my paycheck. It never laid in a title. It never laid in position. It never laid in power, but it just laid in my personhood for my family living in that place. Now acting out of that place, I can do anything I need to do. I walk proudly and confidently into any situation. I'm not afraid to try new things. I'm not afraid to put myself out there because the truth is, here's what I know, Jeff, if I fail, what does that change about who I am as a person? Absolutely nothing. It does not phase me at all because of who I am. And that's my kid's father. That's my wife's husband. That's where my value is, is in my personhood. And honestly, even if God forbid those two things were taken away from me, I am still me. My value is still me and the people around me who are left need me. That's how I am the most value to my family. Lorian said to share it in your friends, the world, the galaxy needs you to be you folks. We need you to be you one last story. And I'll close this out. I remember some years ago, I was a camp counselor, Jeff, with a bunch of kids. Now this camp had a zip line on it. Now, I've never done a zip line. And, uh, uh, some people that I'm, a, I'm a rather larger guy. Weight limits are a thing I have to be aware of me and plastic chairs are not best friends. Let me tell you, I go through some of them. wicker seats, mm -mm, not doing it. Uh, zip lines. No, mm -mm, cause I ain't need that thing to break on me. I remember the kids bugged me. Oh, come do it. Come do it. And I'd, I'd lie and I'd be like, oh, I've done it before. It's not that big. I don't really like it. I, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Finally, I shot my mouth off. I said, okay, fine. Listen, if they have a harness that fits me, I'll go do it. Didn't believe for a second. They had a harness that fit me. Well, guess what? They had a harness that fit me. Dang it. <laughs> and I got up there and I I'm talking to the camp director. I, this became a big deal. Brent's going to go down the zip line. Brent's going to go down the zip line. Everybody in the camp knew it. I'm like, oh my God, what are you guys doing? He's like, he looked at me one day. He's like, he's like, you're going to be fine. I was like, what do you mean? He said, those two carabiner hooks, they're going to, those things test for over 5,000 pounds. You're not 5,000 pounds. Are you? No. He's like, that harness isn't going to rip. He's like, we test that. We test that thing by throwing a car down at a 10,000 pound car. Doesn't phase it. You're not going to hurt this thing. It's not going to break on you. Did I believe that? No, nope. I was like, <gasps> I remember being on the edge of that platform. I'm up there. I'm strapped in. I'm hooked in. People, I mean, they had video camera crews out there. Like the camp just did a, like this whole thing. It was, it was, it was kind of weird, but it was kind of cool at the same time. And I just, and I'm just sitting up there and I remember having this thought. So what happens if 
this thing snaps and I fall. I wasn't scared of dying. You know what I was more scared of? Breaking my neck and being a paraplegic for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. That's okay. what I was really scared of. And, and I had this thought sitting there. Let's say it happens. What does that change about who I am as a person? And the answer was nothing. Because my value doesn't lie in my ability to walk or the things I can do. My value lies in my, in me being me. And with that knowledge and that comfort and that security, that was a breakthrough moment for me. I was able to go down that zip line. And you know what? I went down that thing like Superman because turns out uh, I'm top heavy. <laughs> and where they put the harness, like it was just below my center of gravity. So I flipped upside down and I heard all the way down. But it, hey, it held. The line held. The zip line held. Point being, Sheridan had to let go of these things he was clinging to in order to find his real life in order to be the person everybody else needed to be. And I'll say it one more time. JMS has said it so many times throughout the series of Babylon five. And I'll say it here, folks, it's not in what you do or what you bring to the table. It's in you. And that's what people need you to be. And that's frankly what you need you to be. Jeff, to me, this is a five. You couldn't have done this in star Trek. Mm -mm. This is, this is a story that was uniquely Babylon five. This is a five Delta fury episode to me. Yeah, I can't argue. I totally agree. This was so powerful. And it was funny, too. I like how you started the whole thing with this. How many times have we brought this up? I mean, the concept, I call it the be, do, have mm -hmm. concept, yep. right? And I mean, we, we, so many times we've talked through this. Like, this is the message of Babylon 5. Be you. The you you're meant to be. And I think when I think about that, it becomes really powerful when we look at some of these people. I look at Delenn, for example. There's Delenn the Minbari, right? Is that who she was meant to be? Clearly, no. She was meant to be Delenn the one yeah. who is half Minbari, half human. Sinclair, you could even say. Was he really Sinclair or is he actually Ben Valen all along mm. and just needed to come to a place where he saw that and could accept that? What is Sheridan going to be when he comes back, mm -hmm. right? I think, I think that Sheridan has spent a lot of his life trying to be a good son to his dad and his mom, trying to be a conspiracy theorist for one episode, mm -hmm. trying to be a good <laughs> soldier, <laughs> right? You know, try, trying to be a good soldier then trying to, you know, trying to be these things. And I think face to face with, with death, right? Being trapped between the tick and the talk he finally knows for the first time who john sheridan really is and yeah. i think when he comes back it's not going to be business as usual with him and i think it's going to be really exciting and really cool well jeff you know we are here creating the absolute 100 percent completely accurate definitive ranking of the fourth season of babylon 5. jeff it falls on you this week my friend where are you placing whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi? Now we only have one episode outside of this one. This is only episode number two. Last week's episode. The hour, the of, hour the of the wolf is currently sitting at number one. Jeff, this is on you this week. Does whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi top the hour of the wolf and knock it out of the top spot? Or does hour of the wolf remain the king of season four so far? Hour of the Wolf was such a fantastic episode. It's my favorite season opener to date, right? It's only one that can unseat it. Maybe it will change our mind on a second watch through, but it was so good in so many ways. And we talked about that last week. This episode had so much going for it. We just talked about it. It's a five Delta Fury episode. Fantastic. It was also a little disjointed, had a lot of weird different stories that were being told that weren't maybe necessarily mechanically done. Um, in a way that was super cohesive, mm -hmm. but you know what we got in this episode, we got Londo and Jakar and we got Londo going through a monologue that it, it's been two days since I last watched this episode. It is still haunting me the way he delivered that line, especially when he's like, they'll cut you from here to here. Mm -hmm. And he went into that. Oh my God. 
Like the places that Peter Jurisic had to go in his mind and his psyche to be able to deliver that, mm-hmm. it's it, it's horrifying to think about that. That could that's one of those scenes. They got done. They got done recording, right, and shooting. He walked out the door, and then he probably went and threw up, or passed out, <laughs> you know, or cried in a ball right. in the corner somewhere. It was so powerful, Brent. This is the new number one episode of season four. Cannot disagree uh, whatsoever. Well, that's it for whatever happened to Mister Garibaldi. Next week we are watching the summoning for the first time. Now, we've never seen these episodes before. We haven't read uh, any recaps or synopses. We haven't looked at thumbnails or anything. We just know the title of the episode and the game we love to play. It's guessing what it's going to be about based on title alone. Brent, what do you think the summoning is going to be about? The summoning, huh? Okay, I'm going with Sheridan. I I think we've got this. We're on the Sheridan train right now. Um, I think this one focuses on shared and at least the summoning aspect. I, I still, I still kind of feel like there's a little bit of the, the, the breaking of the fellowship and we're following all the different stories. Like there's going to be mm-hmm. Londo. Now it's Londo and Jakar and maybe Veers over here. And we've got, uh, uh, Delenn and the, the Rangers heading out over this way. And you've got Sheridan and Lorian hanging out over here and Garibaldi's doing whatever. We'll figure that out soon too. Uh, but I, I think the summoning is going to focus on Sheridan and somehow he is going to be summoning the power of the ancients to himself as he as he seems to have let go he's found his reason to live not his reason to not die and and uh he he's gonna like i I think sheridan's about to level up okay and it's it's there's a reason he's the only one to ever make it down here and and like i'm not saying he's gonna achieve god status or he's ascending or anything like that no but Jason Ironheart for, for no, him yet. No, but he is leveling up and whatever that means. And 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 I, I or or it's the other way. He's gonna be summoned by a collective of the ancient ones. You know, they 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 didn't die, they just went out beyond the rim. Right? So maybe he's gonna be summoned beyond the rim to 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 discuss something, maybe something along those lines. Think like uh um uh Jim in Troll Hunters getting summoned to the ancient troll hunters to go talk yeah. with them or something, something like that it is like basically guess. Sheridan's journey. Isn't done. He's not popping no. back to Babylon five necessarily. I don't, th- I don't think so. Not yet. I think he's got it. There's, there's a, a leveling up. He's got to go mm-hmm. through now that he's, he's gone through his piece with Lorian. What about you? I think this, I think this one's going to focus on Garibaldi actually kind of hope so. i think that's i hope so too I, but i think this is going to be um it's going to go into some of what led to like we're going to get a little flashback to like what led to that scene because he clearly was under duress and had some had some stuff they mentioned multiple times you know it, if it if it doesn't put the lotion on its skin it gets the hose again mm-hmm. basically and so it's like he's been through some we're going to get some of that i i think that the episode will ultimately end with his um, like, be- I still think it's Bester coming in at the end to save him. And I think it's going to be kind of them busting out to head to Babylon five. But I think the summoning piece is going to be Delenn summoning the rest of the, the Rangers mm. and the few remaining league worlds that are interested in, in pitching in. But I don't think things are going to go well for this Zaha doom mission, but I don't think that's going to go badly on Zaha doom. I think it's going to go badly on Babylon five. Like people are going to start questioning why she's making this decision. And there's going to be a lot of strife really about her, really what Naroon was talking about in, Mm. um, was that, uh, ceremonies of light and dark. I mean, no, I, mm. Mm -mm. interludes and examinations. Yeah. And interludes and examinations where he's like, you're, you're, you're going after power. You're doing all these things. I think some of that's going to come to a head and her little battle fleet, like before, like it's going to start falling apart, delaying it. And so then over, not like maybe in two episodes from now, when Sheridan does come back to Babylon five, it'll be just in time for him to be like, no, don't go there. We're going to go do this thing instead. We're going to find out right here next week. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe or follow wherever you get your podcasts. 
And do please stop by Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, anywhere. Leave us a rating, a review. We'll read it here on the podcast. So, Brent, until next time. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, what's up? Do you, by any chance, happen to know where Mr. Garibaldi might be? I do not. And no one knows the shape of the future or where it will take us. I mean, we're not some, some deep space franchise. This station is about something. Jeff, I want you to change that outro a little bit. Yeah. Move Ivanova's line a little bit later. A little later? Yeah, get, get, give it the music thing. And maybe like, like, like when it goes, dun, 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 like kind of have that overlapping her as she says. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, um, as, as a, Hey, I want to propose a change. Okay. I know this is still new. We we've been using this. No one knows the shape of the future or yeah. where it will take us. I, I, I don't know that that's jiving with me just yet. I'm, 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 it doesn't flow. It, it no, doesn't it doesn't flow real well. Um, however, we got something here. Who are you? And what do you want? Ooh. And why are you here? And why are you here? I just just think about yeah, it. Yeah, we'll try it on. We'll try it on. See, next time. see what happens. See what happens. Yeah. Club 65, welcome. You are now into the mysterious Club 65. Club 65 is the after party here at Babylon 5 for the first time. Basically, it just means that you watched the episode all the way to the end and you didn't dip out when we started, you know, saying goodbye. Right. Um, so there is a, there is a sharp drop off the minutes. Jeff says until next click. Yeah. yeah really? Like we, yeah, don't we track that stuff and we could see, yeah, I don't so, even want to hear the joke. Like yeah. that's, we put more work into that than anything on this whole it, episode. Although People I will say this is probably the first time we've not actually taught. Like we started recording and we got like two minutes in. And I was like, oh, we didn't talk about the ending. What's, what's the ending. And thankfully you had something in there and I was like, okay, cool. Just go with a it. placeholder by the way. So, yeah. but I didn't even think to bring it up. Yeah. Didn't even, didn't even catch it. So, but Hey, well done. It, that one works. That was, that was, uh, that was, that was just fine. Um, this one went down a real religious tone that I was yeah. not anticipating heading it. Like I knew there'd be some of it, but I didn't think it'd be that hardcore, uh, in this episode. I had a lot of notes on the religion stuff and yeah. I don't know, maybe that's just, I mean, this is, it's funny. And, and people have talked about this a lot in the comments and other things, but I mean, for, for not being a Catholic JMS really writes Catholic very well. Yeah. Yeah. And especially for knowing uh, his religious persuasion or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's uh, a story there. We haven't, cause we're going to read that autobiography after we're through the series becoming superman i think it's called yeah, you're gonna read that autobiography is it is it on audible i'm sure it is that's a that's about the only way that brent reads these days i think i've heard audible. that P peter jurisic actually does the <gasps> narration i think oh that'd be I awesome think. oh yeah i'm in for that i'm totally in for that um reading okay does reading have this effect on any can anyone else out there relate reading literally puts me to sleep mm. like it like almost anything that i'm reading i, I could be sitting there reading and within two or three pages i'm oh wow <laughs> and and frankly my life is so busy i'm constantly on the go 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 i don't have time to just sit and read you know like unless i'm in the bathroom like that's about and even then i'm still usually working or doing something uh but with an audiobook Cause I do have times when I'm driving or times mm -hmm. when, you know, and just kind of doing some housework, getting ready. I can, if I can multitask by that and, and catch the book, that's, that's how I do most of my, my reading these days. I read before I go to sleep all the time. So usually almost an hour or so I'll read. Really? And yeah. Wow. I stick through it. But, but since I was a kid, like six, yeah. seven years old, I'd sleep before I'd read before I went to sleep. And yeah. I think like my brain is programmed that way that like when I'm done reading, I'm I'm going to go to sleep. No, that's kind cool. of a thing. <laughs> My brain's programmed to watch TV until I fall asleep. Okay. Because that's what I did growing up is, oh, it's time to go to bed. Okay, I'm going to lay in bed and turn the TV on and talk. But that also means if you put me on the couch and say, hey, let's do a movie tonight, and you put me on the couch and, and you let me get anywhere near warm, gone. Gone. When I used to hit the gym real hard. It yeah. was at nighttime because of my work schedule. It was night. And so like I would go hit the gym. We'd, we'd blast it. We'd hit, I mean, this was when I was doing the wrestling 
-hmm. pretty intense stuff. And then I'd go home, shower, take down a post shake and go to bed. And it's hard because now when we go to the gym as a family, we usually go in the morning, but like my brain is still kind of wired that it's an end of the day thing. Uh And so it's this weird, like we're supposed to be going to bed. I'm like, no, we're just starting. So I just don't go to the gym. Solve the problem. It's easier that way. (laughs) That's certainly the fix right there. Yeah. My doctor has thoughts on that, but I mean, what does he know? (laughs) (laughs) This might be the last episode I record. (laughs) Jeff's in uh, traction. Can't do anything because he doesn't doesn't uh yeah, listen to his doctor. Hey, that was a real dark uh dark thing. I was thing. gonna say, man, this took a dark turn real fast. There's the link right there. Get your cool gear. Get your cool gear. There you go. Uh hey guys, that's gonna close out Club 65 for today. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh drop 65 down in the comments down below, and uh we'll see you guys next week for what is this? The summoning. The summoning. It's like a megadeth song. There you go. I like it. Bye guys.